In the mail yesterday, we read the news, a man is planning to sue his parents in India for giving birth to him without his consent. It's the 12 year old's cry, I never asked to be born. But now it comes from a 27 year old who adds, so lawyer up daddy -o. Raphael Samuel said he had a great relationship with his parents, notice the past tense there, but he has compared having children to kidnapping and slavery. Yeah, it's the kind of kidnapping and slavery where you drag someone kicking and screaming from the black void of utter nothingness and forcibly yank them into the world of being, breath, beauty and bliss. It's, it's that kind of kidnapping and, and then you force them against their non-existent will to remain existent in this world, enslaved to life and love and longing, whether they choose it or not. It's that kind of slavery. The worst sort. The 27 year old from Mumbai is an anti-natalist who believes it is wrong to put an unwilling child through the rigmarole of life for the pleasure of its parents. Now there are many cues in this article to the fact that Samuel has no children of his own, but none could be more conclusive than this. He thinks parents have children for their own personal pleasure. This is a theme for Samuel. One of his Facebook memes says, your parents had you instead of a toy or a dog, you owe them nothing, you are their entertainment. Entertainment, says a man who clearly has no children. Uh, now kids are a joy, a privilege, they are wonderful, but anyone who has kids as a hobby will soon find that their new pastime is no longer Netflix binges, but rather blowing on food for what seems an eternity and insisting to your bawling toddler, it's not hot. It has well been said that from the moment you have children, you can only ever be as happy as your least happy child. If Samuel thinks you have kids for kicks, that tells us only about his own motivations, not those of parents more generally. The article goes on, the anti-natalist movement is gaining traction in India as younger people resist social pressure to have children. Now this is what interested me. Uh, you see, I'm not quite convinced that Raphael Samuel is actually legit. Uh, something makes me think he has a touch of the troll to him. There is no need to have children. The Daily Mail takes him seriously, I'm not sure I do. Uh, hard to say where I get my skepticism from. Perhaps it's his obviously fake comedy beard. Perhaps it's the fact he seems to wear a bra on his head for some of his publicity shots. I'm not sure Raphael Samuel is for real, but the anti-natalist movement definitely is. In fact, in India, they're having a big meetup on February the 10th in Bangalore. They have many far more serious figures advocating for their position, and they've been covered in the Times of India and other uh, respectable uh, outlets. There has definitely been a movement birthed, if I'm allowed to use that word. The logic is simple. Here it is, expressed by Thanos in Guardians of the Galaxy. It's a simple calculus. This universe is finite, its resource is finite. If life is left unchecked, life will cease to exist. It needs correct. You don't know that! By the way, if your philosophy sounds exactly like that of the most evil supervillain in the universe, then maybe you're one of the baddies. Are we the baddies? Yep, antinatalism is pretty self-evidently perverse. Uh, we know it's wrong. We know our choices cannot be foundational to our lives because guess what? Our choices were not foundational to our lives, right? We live by the choice and the mercy of others. We know that we owe our existence to our parents, that we owe them gratitude and respect, not lawsuits. We know that life is worth it even in this suffering world, don't we? Well, we ought to. But actually, every failure and every folly in my life is actually an expression of an anti-life philosophy. It's, it's the embrace of death, of the void, of nothing. When we sin, we are all anti-natalists, even though it makes no sense. Every time I imagine that my choice and my autonomy is what's fundamental to my life, I am an anti-natalist. I'm against life. Every time I think of myself as a self-made man, every time I'm proud rather than grateful, I'm an anti-natalist. I'm, I'm against life. Every time I imagine that suffering could never be worth it and so I become hopeless or bitter, I'm an anti-natalist. I'm against life. But life comes down to planet Earth to reverse our way of death. Jesus overturns death. And that doesn't just mean he promises resurrection in the end. It means he conquers the whole way and philosophy of death. He tells you that you do not live by your choices, you live by his mercy and kindness. You are not self-made, you are graced by God. And don't ever think that the suffering of this world is not worth it. Jesus took all the suffering on himself because he made a calculation. He considered the joy set before him, the glorious new life of resurrection, and he thought that the suffering of all the world was worth it. 
That's how every parent reasons when they bring life into the world. They know it will be painful, and they do it anyway because life is worth it. So reject this philosophy of death. Reject this view of autonomy. Reject this view of entitlement. Reject this view of hopelessness. Don't listen to Raphael. You are irrelevant in the scale of things. Listen to Jesus. Embrace life. Hello. Welcome everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the live cast. Yeah. Here we are. We're back again. Embracing life. Absolutely. Embracing the live cast. Yeah. <laughs> here in our cupboard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's getting warmer here, isn't it? It is, yeah. 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 Is it the heater still on? The heater is on. Yeah. It's all right. Shall I switch it off? No, because I've gotten down to t shirt now. Oh, you so, are, aren't yeah. you? <laughs> Feeling a bit cash. <laughs> All right. Didn't know it was a dress down Tuesday, but fine. Yeah. We hope that you are warm and uh, content where you are, mm. well fed. Yeah. Um, we are having our lunch. Please don't feel bad if you are having your sandwich at the same time. That's it's not rude. Or having your breakfast. That's some right. Of you, if you're in the States, that right. might be what you're up to right now. If you're in Texas, do we have, is Bill available? Is here? Bill here yet? Is he here? Will Bill chip in? <laughs> All my exes live in Texas, but uh, <laughs> not, not Bill. He's not there. Oh, never mind. Uh, yes, so uh, today on the livecast, we're thinking about nihilism. Uh, mm. Because, you know, what, what better thing do you have to talk about on a, on a Tuesday lunchtime? Um, <laughs> as you start a very wintry February, mm. um, let's, Wint- let's yeah. talk about the void. <laughs> Staring the abyss in the face. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've just remembered that, that great quote from oh, we should we should have got it ready. But um Big Lebowski. You know Big Lebowski. I've never you? seen it. Oh man. Uh, the it's one with probably the, the my dude favorite film. Yeah, the, the dude. Yeah, the yeah. dude of eyes. Jeff Bridges is the dude. John Goodman is his best friend, who's a Vietnam vet and a little bit loopy. And um and, and at one stage they get pursued by nihilists, right? Right. Um and uh, there's, there's this, <laughs> they're, they're from Germany, and it says, We are nihilists, Lebowski. Nihilists. We believe in nothing. Nothing, Lebowski. And then John Goodman's character says, um, <laughs> Say what you will about the tenets of national socialism. At least it was an ethos. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, for any Germans who may be offended by Glenn's yes. accent there. <laughs> Say nihilists. That's, that's also my Werner Herzog uh, impression. <laughs> The penguin will not die alone <laughs> in the darkness. It's one of the, it's one of those films that I've it, I I know about it. I feel oh, like man. it's it's one of those films that I'm supposed to have seen, but I've not really seen. It's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. Or although although I watched it with my mum uh, a couple of years ago, and I'd forgotten. It's it's like it's broken all world records for the number of f bombs dropped. Ah, oh, right, yeah, the, yeah. Which like like watching it as a student, I was like, it was just water off a duck's back. But when you watch it with your mother, it's yeah. like everyone is a bullet. <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> sorry, mum. <laughs> oh, you try to... Did you ever? When I was learning how to drive, um, I would always play like my music on a cassette player because you know I learned to drive in the 1900s, people. Um, but I would I would always learn how to like change gear. And turn the the volume down on, <laughs> on like some f bomb that's about to do, <laughs> and then change back up into third, and then turn the music up. And it just that just reminds me of that Adam Buxton sketch yes. with the NWA. Help the police! Help the police! He's going, help! Help! Help the police! <laughs> <laughs> we are the only two who, who know, know what we're talking about. If you yeah. know, if you know the Adam Buxton reference, say hello. Yeah, and if you're not familiar with it, don't go and look it up. So. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you look up the help the police version <laughs> because the original is a little different. So we be- we began with a story that I came across yesterday uh which is about Raphael Samuel um mm. who is suing his parents um for having them and he wants everybody to know he has a great relationship with his parents. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He has a great, re- or, or at least he had. <laughs> yeah, it's going so well. And then uh, he's compared having children to kidnapping and slavery mm. um, because you've been taken against your will and forced to live, and yeah. you were not given a choice in the matter. The horror. I know. <laughs> the, the the horror of being taken from non-existence into existence without without your say so. Mm. Well, it's kind of the nature of the case, uh, Raphael Samuel, um, and I. I'm not particularly sure he's the most serious individual. There, there were a few things about his 
video and persona that made me suspicious. No, a number of clues. <laughs> but lots of people have been taken in by him. Like Well, the Daily Mail. The Daily Mail. <laughs> <laughs> start um, when you sent me the link i yeah. did i mean like i said on the, when i responded i was like just on a check that this isn't the onion or news thump babylon b yeah. any of these satirical news right. sites because it reads exactly like that you know i know, I know. <laughs> but he is part of a bigger thing called antinatalism um which which is basically the uh the view that uh we're better off not existing mm. and that it is not it is not only not a good thing it is a positively bad thing to bring more children into a world. Hence uh, Thanos. Hence Thanos. Mm. Yes, mm. yes. You've, you've seen Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, yeah. Was yeah. that Guardians or was that oh, Avengers? Was oh, maybe the, it was Avengers. The Infinity War one, isn't it? Okay, oh, okay. Yeah. 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 I don't know. You do? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I do remember my, my Facebook memes. So. <laughs> Whether I've seen the original or not. But yeah, when your philosophy is basically, you know, the, that of a supervillain, you're probably onto a loser. Maybe, yeah, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, although we've not seen the second part of that film yet, so we don't know. Where's that going? Where's it going? Yeah. I don't know. It, it, it's going towards the destruction of half <laughs> the universe. But isn't that already, hasn't that already happened, hasn't it? Oh, has it? Yeah, yeah. So the that's why the we're here. One. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Well, we, we are the <laughs> beneficiaries of death. There you go. Aren't we? Isn't mm. that part of the gospel? Um but yeah, there is there is this thing called antinatalism. Have you heard of it? Have you heard of this thing called antinatalism? I first came across it because Jordan Peterson. Ding! <laughs> Jordan Peterson was... How far in are we? It's only 11 minutes only 11 past minutes. one. So we, that's, that's, that's quicker than last average, week. About average, really, for us. <laughs> um, he, yeah, he, he did a debate. You can search for um, yeah, Peterson versus antinatalism online. And, and did, uh, he, did he debate a specific figure or did he just... Yeah, a figure. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it was a back and forth. And... Um, uh, <laughs> What's interesting is it's difficult to debate them once you assume their premises. Like, like once you sort of say, surely life is worth the suffering. And they mm. say, nope. Like, where do you go after that? Where do you go? Like, like, like when somebody just says, no, we're, we're all better off dead. It's like, well, I mean, I wouldn't use it as a tactic, but part of me is just like, well, if you, if you really believe it, but why, <laughs> why are we even here having this debate? Why, why yeah. have you not... Yeah, stepped yeah. away off yeah. this coil. If you really think that that is You've the shuffled off this, the fact, coil. the very fact that you're still here, I know. you must think there's some well, exact value. Yes, you know? yes, yes. If you're still here, you're giving a vote for life, aren't yeah. you? You are. Yeah, I, yeah, I'd say that's fair. Yeah, you know? yeah. I often think that we'll we'll get onto this when it comes to kind of apologetics and when people ask the question about suffering in the world. It it is interesting that while ever we are on this planet, we are making a vote that is saying existence is better than not, mm. even in this suffering world, which is incredibly you know mm. painful and it's a veil of tears and all of that. But but anyone who's actually asking the question, um, unless they're suicidal, in which case we we treat them as a pastoral issue and you know we we yeah we rush don't just to their go. aid. Right. We don't just say to people, oh, off you go then, you know. No, no, exactly. And, and actually, it, it seems like we've taken a vote that life is worth it, um, even mm. even with all the suffering. But Absolutely. antinatalists say, no, um, it is not worth it. And, um, and I just thought it, it would be interesting to kind of talk through how that is a sign of um, a nihilistic view in the West, um, the fact that there is this fringe group that is, you know, gaining momentum. Yep. Um, it does point to the fact that I, I think on issues of life and of suffering, we've kind of, the West has traveled East. So Eastern philosophy is very much that, you know, life is suffering, but the great hope is to, you know, to go to Nirvana or to be dissolved into the ocean of being like a drop of water in the sea. Yeah. And because life is just irreducibly suffering and because I want to get rid of suffering, I want to get rid of me. Yep. I want to get rid of existence. And I think the West is embracing that philosophy more and more. And I think antinatalism is, is just one, one clue, one of ten that we'll go through. Um, uh, ways that the West has, invest, uh, has actually embraced a, a far more Eastern view of, of suffering and is actually embracing nihilism. So should we, should we have a look on the screen? Our reasons. Uh, this should be the first one, I think. See, we're prepared. Here we we are. are prepared, people. So, um, <clears throat> if you're on the podcast, we've got up a little picture of mm -hmm. the first five of ten signs that yes. show why the West has embraced death. So this is the first table. That the table I, re one. I received it on a mountain <laughs> <laughs> by the very finger of God. Not really. Um, 
So yeah, ten signs that the West has embraced death. Number one, antinatalism. That there, mm-hmm. there is this movement that has some kind of traction to it. Um, and you might think, well, they're such a fringe group. Um, but, but actually, I hear about it more and more in, in a softer form. So when people say your carbon footprint mm. is so terrible, the best thing you can do is not have kids, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I've def- I think I've definitely come across that. I mean, not, not with people I know, but I've come across that idea on, online of people saying, well, I'm not going to have children because the planet is completely stuffed already and yeah. we don't need to yeah. contribute by having a child. And- right. And, you know, and, and there's a logic to it. Like if, if, if you're bending over backwards and, you, you know, you only ever travel around in a, in a bicycle woven out of hemp and your own sense of smug self-righteousness, if that's your only, you know, <laughs> if that is, if you're absolutely, you know, totally don't turning vegan because of the methane produced by cows, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, actually, another person comes along and just says, well, don't have that third kid and you've more than offset your carbon footprint. Yeah, <laughs> you know? sure. Um, and, and people make those sorts of arguments today, and, and they're very old arguments. So um, uh, Robert Malthus uh, was actually a, a clergyman, um, but uh, he was an economist as well. And uh, back at the, the, at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, he started talking about, um, you know, you, you can look online for these graphs where it has, you know, the population sort of going up exponentially. And the production of food going up at not quite as fast a rate. Yeah. And so at that point where the population rises in excess of our ability to produce food, you have a Malthusian catastrophe right. on your hands. Um, and this, this is a sort of a doomsday prophecy that's been kicking around since like the 18th century. Mm-hmm. But you've, you find it rising up again and again and again and again. And, and, but what we find is that that, gra- that graph never works out in, in practice because it turns out that having people around is is quite good Mm. and that people are quite clever and technology kind of rises to the challenge and human beings rise to the challenge um and that whereas you know people used to say we could never fit four billion people on this planet um we're now you know seven billion and yeah and it looks like we're gonna maybe top out at nine billion and and kind of um that that might be the max um but the Malthusian catastrophe has not uh, has not manifested itself, mm. um, and it, and when people kind of raise that kind of thinking, it's it's hard to escape from the conclusion that they have a kind of an anti life point of view. They they would rather that, yeah, they would rather <laughs> in Thanos's kind of logic <laughs> get rid of a good billion or two, um, because they they basically think yeah we're we're taking up too much space and too much life is a problem. Um, so I, I would say that is one kind of um, one kind of indicator that that maybe we've headed eastward in our vision of suffering. Um, maybe we're all nihilists now in the West. So number one, anti-natalism. Yeah. And then number two, um, and I haven't put this in any particular order. I don't know why this is number two in particular, but but number two, I've said um, childbirth is considered by some as violence, right? Um, and, you know, I, I, I came across this, like, a couple of years ago. Caitlin Moran, who is uh, an author and a columnist at the Times, um, who I love, and I love reading her stuff. But she, she tweeted out a couple of years ago this, this very pro-choice um, tweet. And, and she basically said, don't, don't um, tell me what to do with my unborn child because you're not the one who has to have their fanny smashed up by this, by this baby. Um, and so, and and that that's kind of a very visceral kind of way of d- describing this view that childbirth is kind of considered violence. Yep. Um, and that's like obviously from Genesis three onwards, we know that childbearing is cursed and painful and and horrific. And actually, all the troubles in this world that we face <coughs> are often likened in the Bible to childbearing because it's basically saying, look. It is incredibly and intensely painful to live right now. But in the end, there's new life. Mm. And that's, that's the, kind of the Christian vision that, yeah, we're going through the pains of childbirth, but at the end, there's new life. And, and every mother will attest, you know, was it horrifically painful? Yes. Was it worth it? Yes. Mm. Um, that's kind of the view. But it's just interesting that our views on, on childbirth are basically these days, well, it, it's a fringe view, but more, more and more people are saying, don't tell... You know, don't say that we need to have more kids in the West. 
even though our you know population level is tanking and we we are by no means like hitting the 2.2 ch- you know child per per adult kind of replacement rate mm. that would actually just keep our population level in Europe we're nowhere near that but anytime anyone suggests well why don't we have more kids there's there's quite often a pushback against that and and saying well it's it's not your but you you do violence to women mm. uh, irredeemable violence to women what violence that is not um, you know, weighed against by the the good of of, of childbirth, um, and so you know that's that's another view that I think it might be a sign um, that in the West we you know we have a view that that suffering is not worth it, mm. that new life is not worth the pain of it. Um, so yeah, that's number two. Childbirth is considered violence, um, and then number three, uh, abortion. Uh, once again, you know, what should we do uh, about the pain and the inconvenience that uh, a child would bring into this world? Well, we, we know what we do in this country 200,000 times a year and globally 42 million times a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and while some of those instances uh, are instances where the mother's life is in danger and, and that sort of thing, largely it's not that the mother's life is in danger. Largely it's... Um, it's that the pain of both childbirth and having the child and having that life um, we don't want to face and therefore we make a choice against life. Mm. Um, and so, you know, the abortion epidemic is, is a lot of things, but one of the things that it is, I would say, is a, is a sign that we're embracing nihilism as a culture. And then, I mean, this, this is an interesting thing, N- number four, um, it's the the phenomenon of wrongful birth. Have you come across this before? Um, well, not really until this morning. I, th- I think it ring- maybe I had come across it, but not really taken it in. It's like, yeah, <clears throat> I, I only came across it a matter of months ago. I, I, there was an article in the New York Times, I think, by a woman who was suing her physician in the States uh, because the physician missed the fact that her unborn child had, I think, Down syndrome. Mm. Or it might have been some might might have been some other condition, and uh, and she's had the child, and she insists throughout the article, love I love my little boy, love my little boy, he's my pride and joy, <laughs> sunshine of my life, but I wish he was never born, and if I'd have known he would have had this condition, then I would have ended his life. I would have killed him. I would have yeah yeah yeah. I mean I love him, but right. If I'd known he was going to be like this, I'd have killed him. Right, right, and so she's suing. She's yeah. suing her physician, um, who missed this, you know, missed this cause of pain in her life because we mustn't face pain, you know, we mustn't face difficulty, and we'll do anything we can to eliminate suffering, even if it means eliminating life. Um, so yeah, so there's this phenomenon of wrongful birth. Uh, I, I was looking up wrongful birth on Wikipedia um, just this morning. <clears throat> and uh, here, here's the definition of, of wrongful birth. It says, The parents of a congenitally diseased child uh, may claim that their doctor failed to properly warn of their risk of conceiving or giving birth to a child with serious genetic or congenital abnormalities. Thus, the plaintiffs claim the defendant prevented them from making a truly informed decision as to whether or not to have the child. Wrongful birth is a type of medical malpractice taught. It is distinguished from wrongful life in which the child sues the doctor. <laughs> right? Right. That's a thing as well. Also a thing. Wrongful life, which is kind of, it, it's a little bit like um, um, Raphael Samuel. <laughs> he's, he's suing his parents. In the case of wrongful life, the child sues the doctor. Um, I wish I was never born. You know. <laughs> yeah. Are we, the, are we the only sane ones left, Glenn? That's, <laughs> that's what I worry about. There's this whole world going no. on. <laughs> just like, what is, just, what is going on? Right. I don't know. I don't know. This is a thing. This is a thing, people. <laughs> it's Wikipedia. Look it up. Oh man, we're, we're only we're only fourth. I know four, four tenths of the way through. I know. I know. So there's another there's another sign that we might be embracing uh, nihilism. Um, here, here's number five. Uh, number five, euthanasia. Um, so I, I, again, we can very much sympathise with. With the case of someone coming to the end of life and um, and they are not compass mentis and and we all know those situations when people say oh, it's not a life, mm. it's no life, no quality of life, it's no quality. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, that's yeah. interesting. The quality of life <laughs> rather than sanctity of life. But yeah, 
people say it's no life it's no life um, and then the pro euthanasia person comes in and says no it's not you're right um, or at least or at least we can legitimately end this this life um, and I think a, a lot of the arguments around euthanasia come from a view of suffering that we we do not have a category for meaningful suffering, mm. um, yep. and it's just outrageous, which it, which it is, and, and and suffering is horrific and painful, and you can't go like five verses in the Bible without being struck by how horrific and what an enemy suffering is, but um, it is also redeemable, um, and it is also there there is also a category of meaningful suffering, um, which we just don't have any longer. Um, and therefore, the euthanasia, the pro-euthanasia argument is basically, we are committed to eliminating suffering, therefore we will el eliminate the sufferer. Mm. Yep. Um, and once, once eliminating suffering is your highest goal, um, everything else follows. Mm. Well, I was thinking about that in relation to, I can't remember which of the, which of the Scandinavian countries it is that's wiped out so to speak, in inverted commas, right. wiped out Down I, syndrome. Iceland has, for instance. Yeah, that's but, yeah. So, yeah. Um, oh, was it Iceland? I thought it was somewhere in there. But there are other, oh, yeah, yeah, there yeah. are others that have taken um, on the test. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it's like, well, how did you wipe out yeah. Down syndrome? Right. Or will we just kill everybody that has it? Right. Like, well, <laughs> right. That's like saying, you know, I've got right. a, a cure for cancer. The way we cure, can't get rid of cancer, is we just kill anyone who gets it. Yeah, yeah. Like, that, it's not yeah. really solving the. Issue, yeah. is it? You know. Did you know there's no cancer in the United Kingdom? <laughs> and why is that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, like, I was I was in a discussion with um, somebody about my Sam Harris Jordan Peterson videos yep. recently, and um, and she she sort of said, "Well, look, Sam Harris, he doesn't believe in the sanctity of life, but he does believe in consciousness, and therefore, if someone is a conscious being, then we need to do everything we can." to eliminate pain and to lead to the conscious well-being of that person. Mm -hmm. um, but then, like, as you're, as you're saying, therefore, one way of doing the maths for Sam Harris is, you know what, let's get rid of all conscious pain. Mm. I know a way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, that would work. Donald Trump, what are those uh, nuclear codes again? Just, uh, <laughs> you know, bang. And, okay, we've eliminated all suffering. Mm. Um, but it's just so interesting how we... As a people, we, we put, and it's very understandable, but we put at the top of the tree of our hierarchy of values, eliminating suffering is number one. Mm. And therefore, you've got to eliminate sufferers. You know, it's what antinatalism is trying to do. It's what, it's what all these things are really trying to do. Um, to get rid of suffering, we want to get rid of sufferers. Um, and so euthanasia is just one, one symptom of a wider malady. Um, number six... Um, Here's, a, here's another sign uh, that the West has embraced death, that we're, we're quite nihilistic now. Um, I think in evangelism, um, the question of suffering and evil is considered catastrophic to faith. Like, mm. it's an absolute defeater. Um, in a way that, outside of the West and down through history, um, people have suffered, yeah, but, but people have not, not yeah. said there can be no God, therefore. Mm. In fact, that's that's kind of like only really in the 18th century and the and the uh, the earthquake in Lisbon. Um, only really then, in like the 1750s, was it? Um, did people really shake their fist against God and, and say there can be no good God when there's such such suffering in the world? Mm -hmm. Which is just really interesting because nowhere else on the on the planet kind of asks the questions that we ask on suffering. Um, I often think the what was it, what was the name of that bus? Um, uh, that bus uh, advertisement. Yeah, the atheist one. Like, yeah. There's probably no. There's probably no god. Probably no god. So just in. Just enjoy yourself just enjoy and stop. It. So stop worrying. Stop worrying. Enjoy life and, and enjoy your life. Mm. Yeah. 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 And drive that through. Right. Downtown Baghdad or something. And right. Right. See the response. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was a Melbourne bus campaign that was. Um, it was a quote from Woody Allen that said, um, "If God exists, I hope he has a very good excuse." Yep. Classic. <clears throat> And again, you think, well, who who is it who's asking that question? It's Woody Allen, who is talented, artistically fulfilled, rich, famous, top of the tree. Mm. Um, he says, God better have a really good excuse, right? Whereas if you drove his bus through a slum in Nairobi, yeah, and I, I don't think they'd even understand the sentiment. The sentiment. Mm. If God exists, he better have a good excuse. You know, like, 
you know, 50% of them are in church. You know, you, you go to the, the biggest slum in the world in Kabira, like next to Nairobi, and, you know, like 50% are like going to church on a Sunday. It's, it's not like they don't understand why suffering is such a catastrophic defeater for faith. Mm. They, and they know a heck of a lot more about suffering than we do. Yeah. So we're missing something, you know? I guess, I guess it comes from a position of, of entitled comfort, doesn't it? You mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. Or, the people who are moaning most about suffering are those who actually are probably the most comfortable people in the world right. in reality. Right, right. Um, because as as we've been better and better at eliminating suffering, we cling to it more and more as our highest value. And, mm. and therefore, if if all suffering is not eliminated, we thought, well, surely God would eliminate all suffering because we cannot have a category in our thinking for meaningful suffering, justified suffering. Um Whereas our ancestors all did, and our brothers and sisters around the world do, but we don't. Mm. Number seven, uh, commitment phobia. We'll go through these ones uh, quickly because uh, uh, we want to get on to uh, our interview with uh, Andrew Wilson in a second. But um, commitment phobia, I, I think, you know. <laughs> I'm not ready to talk about that yet. <laughs> <laughs> maybe next week, but <laughs> maybe I'll have something else on. But like, yeah, like, like. Just like last month, I was reading about a woman who was marrying herself. Just herself. You know, marriage yeah. is on the decline, but people are marrying themselves. Did I see someone who married their phone the other day? <laughs> <laughs> We've all done that. We're all, we're, In we're many all, ways, we're, we're all, all married seeing to our, our phones phone. on the side. He <laughs> says, sitting there with a laptop, an <laughs> yeah. iPad, and a mobile phone sitting next to him all at the same time. Till death us do part. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take me from... I just hook it into my brain directly. <laughs> yeah, the they will. They will. Uh, yeah, it'll cover time. But yeah, there are people who are marrying themselves. I just think I would divorce myself if I could. Like, there, are, there are people marrying themselves and uh, and not marrying one another. So we're, we are commitment phobes. Um, number eight, the extension of adolescence. You know, people mm. people are just not settling down and getting a job, and you know, and, and there's economic factors for that. It's hard to get onto the property ladder and blah blah blah. But we are delaying adulthood. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of the kind of man child thing going right. on isn't there right i've certainly no not i've certainly seen it not in kind of close friends but people i know where i just kind of think come on now you're same age as me you're in your early 30s and your priority seems to be playing halo like. right <laughs> right and um you know i'm yeah. up for a game of halo you know but <laughs> just think there's got to be a paul is actually up for a game of halo so yeah, please so, do get in touch yeah in let me know your uh your gamer name. Uh, <laughs> What's yours? Uh, I don't actually have one, but I would, of course, I'd be. You know what it would <laughs> you'd be. be totally up for. You need what? The Feasonator. The Feasonator. The feasonator. Okay. So you can't be the Feasonator because it's too long. So uh, you can't hide behind anything because uh, whenever you hide, the your, word sticks the, out. Like. The tag. Oh, man. Right. Oh, man. These are the problems. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Personal problems. Such suffering. I know. Look. Eliminate it. <laughs> uh, and then the last two. So, you know, recreation is thought of as detachment. Like when, when we think of rest, um, like rest in the Bible is quite interesting. Like rest is like having a meal with people and mm. it's community and it's actually engaging with people. Rest for us today. Yeah. Not so much. Yeah. That's quite <laughs> difficult to hear as, a, as an introvert. <laughs> You, you you never you never get life or oh no no I do I mean some people are proper introverts yeah. aren't they and they don't yeah. they can't they don't like it. but I find yeah. you know I like it and then I'm like now you need to go but so even, I can... yeah <laughs> even even with like total introverts and I know I know many of them like like the worst thing for them is to leave them in their total introversion like like right you, yeah you, yeah you, you, you got to come out of yourself mm. a little bit and sure. a little bit more than you might ordinarily want to come out of yourself by. But, you know, these days, rec- recreation is binging on Netflix, you know. Uh, it's vegging out, you know. Um, and and again, you know, doesn't that sound like Nirvana, right? <laughs> kind of <laughs> dissolving into the ocean of being, just vegging out in, in, front, of the, in front of the box. Um, and then number 10, I've put... Um, here's an, uh, another sign that the West has embraced death. It's the cut toxic people out of your life memes. Oh, uh, yeah. Which are rife. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely everywhere. Yeah, I mean, and, and like I un- I understand there are there are times when you need to need to step away from relationships that have, that have turned sour. Like you know, Jesus does say you know you shake the dust off your feet in certain circumstances. Absolutely, but yeah. there's definitely also also a kind of angle of 
people say, oh, well, if anyone's saying anything to you, if anyone's questioning what you're like, you know, right. um, then cut yeah. those people out of your life. You do you. You, you do know, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually, wasn't it, it was it was this morning we were reading, weren't we, about the wounds of a friend, right? And stuff in proverbs, yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, actually, that's that's true, isn't it? That, the wounds of a friend are a blessing. Yeah, and we need those right. things. We should be like, oh, just cut out those toxic people. Yeah, you know, no, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. You're saying anything bad, right? Or anything that questions me, right? And the way I am. Yes, and I mean, I, if there are abusive people in your relationship, then absolutely, yeah, you need to, you need to be very wise about that. Mm. But the glee that people have, like, I'm going to cut the toxic people out of my life and spend time on someone who loves me. <laughs> me, you know. Yeah. Right, and I said, didn't I, about I said the Babylon Bee posted their article yesterday, <laughs> which says God, God decides to cut all toxic people out of his life, 7.5 billion dead. Like, <laughs> you know. Yeah, we're very glad that God has not <laughs> cut the toxic people out of his life. So there you are. There's, there's our little uh, top 10 of uh, reasons why the West has embraced death. Ah, happy new year everybody <laughs> hope you're all doing great I feel like that needs its own jingle you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but we um, so like when for instance we talk about being pro-life or a culture of life we're not just talking about a single issue like mm. we're, actually, we're actually talking about um, a real embrace of the gospel which allows us to say that um Suffering can be worth it, and we will engage with the world in all its mess in order to come through that mess. Just as childbirth leads to new life, so this suffering world needs engaging with. And let's not, let's not do the Eastern thing of detaching, 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 mm -hmm. but of actually engaging with life because life is worth it. Um, anyway, my little two cents. Um, shall we um, just talk about... Uh, have there been any comments? What have what have people said about me? Um, <laughs> <laughs> do you like me? Do you? Um, oh yeah. George Osborne says Paul is never in his early thirties. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so kind, George. You can come again. <laughs> early, early, yeah, early. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, not long. Another month or so, and I'll be the same early. age as. Uh, uh, as Jesus was when. Ah, uh, uh, wow! I don't wow. know why in my head I've always had that as a kind of like yeah 30, cut off point thirty three <laughs> the cut off point. But I'm just like thirty three, like yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just weird wow. thing. Yeah. But it is that thing like when you see a sports person and and they're like they're considered old, oh, yes. right? And they're you know they're 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 trotting out for Australia, trotting out for England, age thirty four, and you're like, that's. That's actually younger than me. Yeah. And then Premier you know, League football. They're like, well, he's 28 now, so he's he's yeah, at the end yeah. of his career. <laughs> and you finally resign yourself to maybe I won't play for Manchester United. You know, yeah, maybe, yeah. I mean, <laughs> maybe it's not going to happen. Um, yeah. So 33. Yeah. Well, Jesus saved the world by this age. What have you I done? Know, exactly. What have you done? Come on, man. Hey, I've got a year. Like, <laughs> <laughs> watch this face. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to do a Beatles now, you know, bigger than Jesus. Who thinks? Yeah. Oh, dear. Man. So uh, last night, we'll probably only play one uh, clip from last night, but last night we uh, put up a uh, an interview that I did with uh, Andrew Wilson in this very space. Wilson! Wilson! Um, Again, I've never seen the actual film. Yeah, I've only seen the meme too. <laughs> I just know that. Wilson! <laughs> um, and it was a... Brilliant conversation. I really uh, loved it. He's uh, got a, a new book out called Spirit and Sacrament, A Welcome to Eucharismatic Worship. Nice. Yeah. It's a neologism. A neologism. <laughs> two words together, people. We're all learning two. things today. <laughs> yes. So good. Add to your word list. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we got into a conversation about, uh, so there's the, 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 there's the Eucharistic side of things and there's the charismatic side of things. And the Eucharistic mm -hmm. side of things is the more traditional liturgical side of things. And the charismatic side of things is the more charismatic side of things. So, um, and it tends to be that never the two shall meet. Right. It's kind of yeah. general thoughts. You know, that's generally how it works out in practice. Often. Except in Andrew Wilson's capacious brain. His mind. In his mind, it, right. all, fits, it all fits together. <laughs> and he, he paints a compelling picture for it all. And, um, and then, so we got on to talking about lots of stuff. I've put the, um, the link to the full interview in the comments. So do check it out because it was... Uh, it was a great back and forth. Yeah, it was really um, good. And uh, we just thought we'd, we'd play you one little bit. Uh, when we got onto charismatic gifts, should we have a look at... Uh, uh, which, which one is oh, it? The, know, the abuse of gifts or the... Are, we, are the gifts we're continuing today with the, the same ones? Let's do the continuing gifts today. Okay. Good. Clip. Okay, right. Let's, so hopefully this is the right one. We'll see. 
one of the tweeters uh, said, uh, "What do you make of um, Tim Challey's kind of review of your book, which was which was charitable and and mm -hmm. um, drew out lots of positives?" But one of the things he raised, and it, and it was a question that I had as well, is. Um, yes, okay, but what do we continue? Mm -hmm. Is what we see in the 21st century, what Paul is talking about in Corinthians or what we mm -hmm. see in Acts, or um, is this that? And, and I can think of a couple of things like, you know, prophecy. Um, it's, it's just interesting what we think of, you know, the, the most famous book on preaching written by a Puritan, William Perkins, was The Art of Prophesying. Mm -hmm. and, and he just took it for granted that prophesying is yeah. heralding the voice of Christ in 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 the community. And, and what's interesting to me is I, I, I love Martin Luther's kind of threefold word theology that, that he says that, you know, Christ is the eternal word, the scriptures are the written word and proclamation mm. is this third form of the word that cannot be divorced from Christ and scripture. So you've got mm. to be speaking of Christ scripturally, but to the degree that you do that, you are heralding the voice of mm. Christ. And actually Luther's got a space in his theology that a lot of Presbyterians, for instance, mm. don't. Mm. A lot of Presbyterians will say, ah, you know, if, if someone addresses a charismatic congregation and says, I think God is saying to us all X, I don't know how to distinguish that from scripture. Yeah. And therefore there's a, there's a yeah, power yeah. clash. And you're, and you're thinking, actually, well, go back to Luther, because Luther's yeah. got a way of saying that. He's got a yeah. way of saying, well, look, there's this third form of the word. And it's not necessarily that you're in a pulpit when you do it. You can eyeball a brother or sister mm. and herald the word, the word of Christ in lots of different ways. And yeah. I think we've... So, so I guess my question is, so prophecy, for instance, will mean a certain thing to a certain slice of the charismatic church today. Yeah. Are we positive that that's what it meant for Augustine, for Irenaeus, and for Paul? Uh, no, because I'm, certainly not that those three would all agree on it. I don't know mm. that they would. Um, I, but I think, and I think it depends how tight your, your definition to be. Um, I, I think... So prophecy is a, a, a much better case study in some ways than the others, because I think healing is, you know what a healing is. Uh, mm -hmm. You might disagree about the extent to which someone had a gift of healing, but it's kind of mm -hmm. obvious. Whereas prophecy is more open to disagreement because you see the very obviously predictive prophecy. There's going to be a famine over there and you guys need to send them money in Acts. Uh, you, you clearly have a prophetic speech in Corinth, which seems... You know, it's Paul's corrective is this anybody who prophesies speaks to another person for their edification, consolation and encouragement. And you think, well, that sounds like a very open ended. That could be almost any kind of public speech in the assembly. And then you could, in theory, have anything in between. And actually, when you read Acts, you think, well, the guys who prophesy, Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, travel around the churches telling them how to apply the Jerusalem letter. Uh, while they were praying and fasting, or worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart Barnabas and Saul, which he'd already told them to do. And they went, OK, now we'll send them off on world mission. It's it's not particularly like dramatic. Wow, we'd never heard that. Mm -hmm. That's like, no, we knew we were supposed to reach the nations and we knew these guys were supposed to go. And now we're just working on timing. So there is actually a number of different ways in which prophecy functions, even in Acts. It's not always just predicting the future. There's a, a definition in the book I quote from Anthony Thistleton, which I think is really helpful. It's like a paragraph long. This is how prophecy functions for Paul in the Corinthians correspondence. And I think it's a really good discussion that is effectively saying may or may not be spontaneous, but it's public, exhort exhortatory, encouraging, edifying or confronting speech that builds up the addressees and that nevertheless ca mistakes can be made. And because it is spirit prompted, but isn't that spirit underwritten in every detail, it needs to be weighed and tested. And I think mm. that does cover some of the very agabus kind of prophets, which I've certainly been, received things like that of mm. extraordinary insight, like this is what's happened, you know, mm. on, on one occasion this is what was in your inbox this morning. Like, my goodness, that's terrifying. Mm. Um, what if it hadn't been something good in my inbox, but had been bad? Um, genuinely, it's like, wow, it puts the fear of God into you. Through to prophetic insights in the midst of preaching or a more prophetic kind of sermon, and including things like Charles Spurgeon, who you mentioned earlier, where you, whether you would use the word, he didn't use the word prophecy or not, but actually he told the story with all kinds of echoes of texts about prophecy in that in that mm -hmm. passage, where he's, he says, this guy over here, his soul is sold for fourpence. He just pilfered this amount. He didn't put in the offering. And uh, and I think so in a sense, the word is broad. And I think as such, that definition would cover what Basil and Irenaeus and Paul all meant. Probably, I don't think Augustine quite 
but I haven't read all of Augustine and there's plenty of it, hmm. would be different certainly from what Perkins would mean by it, but Perkins' view, view would fit within that overall rubric, and I think Spurgeon's would as well. So uh, in a sense, I think it's the, only the very tight definitions of prophecy, as in prophecy is only that speech which tells you something that no human being could possibly have known, either about the future or about your inner life. Uh, that, of course, then is very... That's very constrained and is quite narrow, mm. but I don't think that's necessarily what Paul is doing in the Corinthian correspondence. I think there's a much mm. broader range of speech that yeah. he's addressing. Yeah. And yeah. so I think that definition actually includes many of those kinds of prophecies we've talked about. Very good. And one, of the, good stuff. one of the other things uh, he said is that, uh, and it would be interesting to, to see what people think about this, is that Andrew said um, he can't think of an example where someone who's not Jesus gives a personal, private prophecy to somebody else. Right. But actually, the exercise of the prophetic gifts is always in the context of the community. It is always to be weighed by the elders. You're meant to test the spirits. Um, and, and he was sort of advocating for, okay, if you want to exercise whatever prophecy is, if you want to exercise it in the congregation with elders weighing it, um, then that, that is the sort of the, the healthiest context for it. And I think if that if that is the case, then I think that really um, undercuts the possibility of those private words where somebody says, you know, I know why you didn't get the job. It's because of unconfessed sin. or I've know. really got a sense that this is going to happen or that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, that you're going to mm. marry me. Yeah, God, God gave me the dream. Me. Yeah, it's oh not man, gonna happen, Glenn. It's not going to happen. In bigger, in bigger <laughs> churches, you'd be, you'd be surprised. Like uh, at All Souls Langham Place, which is where I, I worked for a year, and um, and it's, it's not like a charismatic church. It's, it's conservative evangelical, and and yet the mm, number of times yeah. that women in the twenties and thirties group would come and and say, so and so has just told me he had a dream in which we got married, and and he's he's really putting pressure on me to marry him. Really, and we Gosh. like we we had to learn that the response was just tell him. He didn't give me that dream myself. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. I'm still waiting on the Lord I'm, for I'm that one. I'm still waiting on like, that dream myself. And, goodness me. You know. Well, it's it's interesting, though, because that kind of words of knowledge type mm -hmm. idea, I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot of that around, isn't there? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. You, know, people say, you know, people say, oh, I really feel God is saying. Yeah. But uh, is he distinguishing there, so between saying, I feel God is saying to the church, yes. like our community, is he saying that's probably still that could be part of it, but it's just the very much like Glenn to you. Yeah, God is saying that that he doesn't see that in Scripture. Do you think? I think he he would see that as sometimes happening, but it happens in front of other people. Um, so you know, Paul is told, "Look, you're going to go in chains to to Jerusalem," but it's in front of other people. It's not. It's okay, not the, so not just yeah private. Not the private word. <laughs> you you're going to marry me and. Uh, and I think I think if if that if that was the context for people giving words, um, that that would solve a heck of a lot of um, pastoral damage that sometimes happens with the abuse of this gift. Mm. Um, I mean, like the most the most successful I've ever seen a word of prophecy work was was when I said to before before I was married to Emma, there I was in a in a restaurant with the woman that I, that I loved, and I shot up a prayer and I said, um, God, if I'm meant to marry this woman, then give her a vision of our wedding day. Mm. And as soon as I prayed that prayer, she smiled. And I said, what did you smile about? And she said, nothing. I said, were you thinking about our wedding day? She said, how did you know? I said, I just prayed that if we were meant to get married, that you'd pray about it, you, you'd, you'd think about our wedding day. Oh. <gasps> right? So then there was really no way out for her. Then there was, was really <laughs> no way out. Now, this, this woman, um, as it turned out, was actually cheating on me with somebody else. Uh, not my wife. This is this is not oh, Emma. So this wasn't Emma. This wasn't Emma. Right? I thought you were saying it was this Emma. Is, no, I know. I, right? I, I okay. Tried to, I tried to lead you to think. Oh, of see. Right. Ooh. Ooh, oh, the plot thickens. Oh. So right. she, yeah, she would have been um, a bad person to marry. She she right. she came to me later and said, "I don't want Jesus anymore. I don't I don't want you." And and um, and yet, well, we had that moment, and I had that word, and I like. So what? What do you do? What do you do with that? You know, and you know. And what do you do with it? What did you? Do? I don't know. Well, like as I've thought about it, you know, for the last seventeen years, then like I, I do think um, the heart is deceitful above all things, and we're always wanting to rubber stamp what we already want. Yeah, and if we can rubber stamp yeah, it with true. the voice of God, then fantastic. Even better. And you know, there was a lull in the conversation, and I kind of thought of our wedding day, and I kind of prayed, oh, please, 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 God, may she think about it. And you know, as it happens, she did. But is this is this a sign? Is this you know? Mm. Um. So, 
like absolutely, Andrew's absolutely right about pursuing the gifts and uh, and pursue prophecy in particular. Um, but we need to figure out what prophecy is actually, mm. um, and we need the, that healthy context. I think of a wider body of people. Um, and part of it, we, part of the conversation there is to do with like preaching as well. Mm. Um, yeah, and what what role that has in right in being prophetic, right? You know, because I, I think I guess as I read. As you read a lot of the Old Testament prophets, you you do get future prediction. Mm-hmm, sometimes, but often you do a lot of it is kind of calling people back to yeah. what God has already revealed. Yeah, yeah you know, absolutely. And, and simply saying, "Well, this is what God has said." Yeah, yeah. Come yeah. back, and which is very much a kind of you know when you preach, you're very much saying, "Well, this is what God has said." Yes, yes, yeah. Let's come back, or we yeah. need to go and do X, Y, and Z, and yeah, yeah. Yeah, so to, what do we say? Because because there will be some people who would say, well, but it can't be that because because the gifts are you know preaching and teaching and they, these must be separate things. Hmm. I don't know how we. Well, I mean, you you just got to ask yourself um, if what we've come to see as prophecy and words of knowledge was unknown to most of church history. You got to you got to question that. You know. Yeah. Um. And and but 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 I think the challenge comes to every different slice of the church mm. you know so so spurgeon who you know is a cessationist um you know has a word of knowledge that that person stole from that person and he calls him out in the middle of a sermon and it was true and he, he just pilfered fourpence from the other guy and um and what do you do with that well i've got to have i've got to have all the space in the world for that in my preaching and not only have space for it i i want it mm. i i want to have that you know and i i'm to eagerly desire that gift but but also you know in other slices of the church if what is being given the label of tongues or prophecy or that kind of thing if it if it's been unknown to vast ways of the church you've got mm-hmm. a question got to wonder you know and we're kind of focusing on one side here because his other his other side is really about um the liturgical side yes. sacramental side yes and the sacramental side those, those those of us who are more entrenched in kind of the sacramental end of the church mm-hmm. he's saying you know eagerly desire the spiritual gifts and right. that will look different right maybe for different people right um but here's what it is but equally then he's saying to the the more charismatic end of the church but there's all this kind of sacramental stuff that you're missing out on as well yeah, yeah. um and you know which wasn't really part of that conversation we watched uh or heard there but um yeah you know, it does come up, and obviously that's kind of the thing in the book. And yeah, um, I think there's probably, you know, there's a lot of truth in that as well. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. There's, you know, I would say growing up in a church which was, you know, uh, you know, Anglican, full of liturgy. Like as a teenager or a young person, kind mm-hmm. of just, you kind of plow through the liturgy, and you're a bit like, oh my goodness me, like, just you're just mm-hmm. reading it out, you know, saying the right. same things, going through the motions, going through the man. motions. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, and you know, but whereas I can see now, uh, when we do have liturgy, um, you think actually we're we're saying things which are good, yeah, good and true, yeah, declaring stuff that is good and true, um, you know, and and in the sense of, you know, in the sense of there being confession and stuff like that, and, right, right, uh, which doesn't really feature necessarily for some right parts of the church on a in a community sense, right, so much um, creeds and. Yeah. Not, but, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. So it's a great book. Do get hold of it. Uh, Spirit and Sacrament: An Invitation to Charismatic, uh, You Charismatic Worship uh, by Andrew Wilson. Um, terrific book, and uh, it will stimulate you. And uh, wherever you line up, in whatever uh, place you are in the church, I think there will be challenge and encouragement there. Um, because basically, his whole thing is that God has given us gifts, and some of the gifts are sacramental, and some of the gifts yeah. are um, charismatic, as we come to understand the term. I, I yeah, I'm probably going to go out and read it. Yeah. And, and actually, the, and and you know that's that's uh, I I don't I don't read a lot of books because yeah. often I think you know yeah. it's just another one on the same kind of topics. Yeah. Um, yeah. But actually, this one makes me kind of go, oh, this would be really this is something kind of needed and be interesting to hear what is said. And I, also, I just think Andrew Wilson always does a great job. Oh. Um, I really love how he is at kind of more that charismatic end of the church. But actually, mm. um, you know, he, he's a, he's a very kind of talented theologian as well. Who yeah. I think theologically, I yeah, you know. I'm quite happy to sit with as well. So yeah, um, he is a good one. He is a good one, and it's sparklingly written as ever with Andrew Wilson. So do get that. Um, check out the uh, the interview that I did. I've given a a, a link in the uh, Facebook uh, comments. And it should be on Facebook tonight as well. It'll be it? on Facebook tonight. The whole thing. That's the aim. 
and uh, it's on YouTube. Uh, we'll do a special podcast uh, version with the whole interview on it, and we'll do a podcast version of today. Um, someone asked just the other day, oh, you're on YouTube, but you're not on podcasts. We are on podcasts. We We're yep. totally on podcasts. <laughs> uh, search for... Um, uh, so the Speak Life podcast. The so Speak if you go to speaklife.org.uk forward slash SLP, that yep. will take you to the page. Right. Then Excellent. You can find them all. From and there's also Reading Between the Lines, uh, RBTL. RBTL, um, yeah, all the acronyms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you can check out our podcast there. If you want to donate to our charity, uh, we exist because of the generosity of people like you guys. You just so make your checks payable to Paul Feasley. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't listen to Paul. Um, <laughs> Uh, speaklife.org.uk slash give and there are lots of ways to give uh, tax efficiently especially if you're a UK taxpayer so thank you so much for that and um, yeah so look out for the bonus podcast look out for the podcast of this um, and uh, yeah and um, sign up to emails that's, that's right. always helpful for us as well just yeah. in case you, if you want to catch up always make sure you see our stuff I don't know about you I like some Facebook pages but there's so much stuff coming out that it's easy to miss it. It doesn't appear in your feed for some reason, algorithms. Mm. Uh, if you sign up to our email list, um, then you'll get an email on a Friday kind of saying, this is what's been going on. And we've got prayer points on there as well, so it's really helpful to be praying for us. So I believe it's speaklife.org.uk forward slash sign up. Yeah, you sign go up. for that. Or there's a or button on the, the Facebook page. page. Oh, yeah. there's a button on the Facebook, on the Facebook page. page. There's oh, a sign page. up button you can click. It yeah. will take you through, so that'd be great as well. Very good. Thanks so much for being with us. I'm off to Warwick to go and preach at uh, their university uh, Mission Christian week. Union uh, events week. Great. And, uh, so pray for, pray for me up there, and uh, yeah, we'll see you again next week. From Southampton. From Southampton. Yeah, yeah. we'll be from Southampton. We'll be live from Southampton next wow. week. So might be, a, this might be a slightly different time, but yeah. 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 We'll see you then. Cool. All right. Ciao for now. Take care, folks. Bye.